So this is uh, e-patient Dave, and I'm having a hallway conversation at TED Med with Anna Saruman. Did I say that correctly? Great. And uh, she has just had the incredible and unusual honor of having the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, make federal policy uh, something that she had advocated for for uh, two years I think that sprang out of the birth of her own daughter. So could you share the story for us? Daughter Eve was born a little over two and a half years ago and um, she was diagnosed with congenital heart disease at two days old. She had a quite severe heart defect and kind of an underlying condition along with that that was exacerbating. And fortunately, our care team in Minneapolis was able to keep her alive long enough to get her to almost three and a half months of age. Right? She required two surgeries to save her life. So at the time, we flew her to Boston, as you know, um, Dave, and, and she um, underwent two successful heart surgeries. And upon her recovery and working with surgical teams and cardiology teams in both places, I wanted to find a way to figure out how we can help with diagnosis early in intervention of cases um, for these neonatal patients who are often, believe it or not, sent home from the hospital with undiagnosed congenital heart defects. So um, one of the things we decided to do was start, was start a pilot project to screen these babies using a very simple, non-invasive method called pulse oximetry. It's low cost and has a cost of a diaper change. And um, this little beam of light goes through the hand or the foot of the child, measures the oxygen in the blood, and is a very good indicator of whether or not they might have a heart problem. Detects about 75% of those defects, actually. So in starting that pilot project, the Minnesota Department of Health was involved, which was wonderful, and they asked me to come and talk to them a little bit about it um, in the fall of 2009, so about six months post-op for Eve. And then um, at that time, I met a doctor from the Mayo Clinic who happened to also serve on the Federal Advisory Committee that advises the Secretary of Health and Human Services um, on conditions, heritable conditions in newborns and children. <laughs> And he thought the time it was actually very good to perhaps pursue this as a federal um, recommendation. And so that's sort of the pathway that we took. Um, and in really, in just a few short months, in January of 2010, the condition, critical congenital heart disease, was nominated through that body. And an evidence review process happened. The committee voted in September of 2010 to make that recommendation to the secretary that all newborns in the United States be screened for this most prevalent of all birth defects, affecting one in 100 babies. Um, and it did take the secretary almost a full year, but a month ago in September, she did accept that recommendation. And uh, from there, it's moved forward with implementation on a state-by-state -state level to have that as an addition to the panel of things we screen newborns for before they leave the hospital. So it was nominated in January of 2011? Nominated in January of 2010, Ten. voted on for okay. recommendation to the secretary in September of 2010. Oh, so okay. it took almost a full sure. year from the time the committee voted, her advisory committee voted, sent it to her. And then she statutorily had a half a year really to respond to that. And then after half a year's time, um, there were still some implementation and infrastructure uh -huh. questions. So she convened another body called the Interagency Coordinating Committee that included um, CDC, NIH, HRSA, mm -hmm. FDA. So a, a small but powerful group to look sure. at those remaining issues and provide to her kind of an action plan, like how do we address these things? Because I think pulse oximetry is a really good idea. I just want to make sure it's not a burden you know, sure. on the states or on the hospitals. Sure. And so those questions were, were answered. And, and like with any new thing, you don't work out all the glitches until you actually sort of start doing it, mm -hmm. um, which fortunately we were doing in Minnesota. Um, and, and are kind of well on our way. And then New Jersey, of course, through state legislation, became the first state in the country to have all of its newborns now being screened for heart disease, and that started in August of this year. Terrific. So uh, I'd like to discuss the participatory medicine angle on this, uh, because now this was not a matter, or was it a matter, of you as the parents being actively engaged with your physicians? Or did, did your idea of activism come up after 
your daughter's condition was all under control? Well, I think the ability to act on it came then because, you know, before that you're focused on just making right. sure your child is well and, and, and not really wanting to bite off more than you can chew. But I think it, it did come during the process because that's when we were interacting so much with the cardiology teams, with uh, the, the surgeon and, and his team in, in Boston, and we really asked those questions of those teams and said, what do you need that you don't have that could help you get a better outcome? And, and potentially reduce disparities even, you know, some of these kids that fall through the cracks in, in underserved communities or in rural communities, like, what, what might help with that? And we thought another clinical tool at, at birth, at 24 hours of age, that could help uh, a pediatrician or a primary caregiver or a yep. family doctor to, to perhaps detect something that is a, is a very hidden, insidious disease and disorder. Sure. These babies are asymptomatic. Right. You have to understand, I mean, my daughter looked fantastic two days old. She was beautiful and pink, you know, just beautiful. And we were set to go home with her. And she would have been dead within, you know, days. Really? That it was, I didn't realize oh, it was that severe. So, so what I hear here uh, is, you know, we think about there's the patient activation measure, which is your, the four levels of do you believe that you can make a difference, basically, in your own health. And it's been proposed that there could be additional levels of that, of patients actually going out and proactively generating valuable contributions to their care. And I'm hearing an additional level here, which is people from outside the medical profession actually helping to redefine what should be done. Well, you know, it's interesting because I had a couple of people ask um, after this happened last month about the Secretary's decision and, and um, you know, do you think it, what do you think the role of being the mom, you know, being the advocate played in all of that? And I said, well, you know, I, I'm not maybe the best person to say, but I will tell you that there were a number of people on the committee and within Health and Human Services that have said to me, this would not have happened without the parent advocate. You needed to be part of it. A, parents in general need to be part of moving something like this forward. If it's just academia, if it's just medicine, um, it's, it just simply doesn't have that extra that extra oomph, I guess, to get it across the goal uh -huh. line. And um, so I would encourage you know, anybody, um, whether you're a parent or the patient yourself, if there's something you believe you have to contribute um, to, to, to making a policy that's going to improve things for patients in your scenario, um, you know, go for it. There are... There are mechanisms for you to actually do that and at the state level and at the federal level, depending on, on the condition. So. Terrific. I encourage you. Great. Well, thanks very much. This is uh, Anna Saarinen and uh, ePatient Dave signing off.